So uh, what I'll talk about today a little bit is um, how to do uh, lighting textures and shadows using a shader. So this is stuff that you should have seen before. Uh, so it's more of a, just a reminder. And then, of course, what I'll show you is pretty much how to do all of that. So clearly, the assignment for next week is kind of, well, what, what are you going to do with lighting and textures, right? So the, what well, I'll change the um, uh, assignment to is, well, go do something where you use the shading, lighting, and textures, and so forth, but look at the performance of your program. So um, play around with different ways of calculating things. And of course, in lighting, there's a fairly lengthy set of computations. Um, so what, which of those computations can you change and optimize the code that I've given you, uh, make it better or worse, or whatever you want to do. So as far as, as lighting is concerned, um, lighting, of course, is what most of graphics is all about, right? Because the subtle changes in the lighting or illumination of a surface is what, uh, how we sense the type of material that it's made of, the difference, the ways that it reflects uh, diffuse or specular light, uh, tells us whether it's a hard surface or a soft surface. Uh, it tells us about the curvature of the surface and so forth. So um, with uh, applying a shader to lighting, um, we basically have the flexibility of doing more than just what is pro um, supported in the fixed pipeline in OpenGL. So the lighting methods um, that you can use are, or that I've covered, is basically the Fong lighting and the blend Fong lighting. Uh, but there's actually a few others uh, that you can go and investigate as well. So typically in the fixed pipeline, what OpenGL will do is it'll do the lighting calculations at vertices and then interpolate across the surface. That's generally advantageous uh, because there are many fewer vertices than there are pixels. So um, if you are really hardware constrained, then that's a good way of doing the lighting calculations and still getting a good frame rate. Um, the problem with that, of course, is when you have relatively large objects um, or relatively large polygons, then the lighting effects don't look quite right, uh, especially when the light's quite close to it. So the better way to deal with that is then to do per pixel lighting, where you do the exact same set of lighting calculations, but you do it on a pixel by pixel basis. And in that case, the distance or the relative distance between the individual vertices and the light uh, doesn't matter anymore. Um, you could also do other kinds of things like, for example, high dynamic range lighting. So in all of our calculations, we've always assumed that the light values are between 0 and 1, right? What you do with high dynamic range lighting is you actually expand that range to whatever arbitrary dimension that you, you want to, and then you can use at the very end a mapping to then tr transform that back to within the range of what uh, the pixel values are that you can represent. So that helps, especially in scenes where you have extremely large ranges of light and things look very dark or very bright uh, if you try to do that all to the same scale. So you can do um, basically weird stuff to make that happen. Uh, the downside, of course, of using um, shaders to do the lighting is the moment you drop the fixed pipeline, you're pretty much on your own as far as doing the lighting calculations are concerned. If you use the vertex shader, of course, there are some things that happen default by default. Um, but for the most part, if you want to do those lighting calculations um, in anything other than the fixed pipeline uh, calculation, uh, then you basically have to write all of the code for yourself. So just a reminder, this is how OpenGL and pretty much everything else um, represents lighting. Uh, we've got the various components. Um, we've got the emissions light, which is just a function of the material. It's basically the light that comes from the material itself. We've got the ambient light, which comes from all directions and gets reflected in all directions. And there's typically two parts to that. One is the global ambient light. Uh, and the other is then the light, the ambient light that's associated with a particular light source. Um, so that's why I wrote it there's that sum. Then we have diffuse light. The diffuse light, of course, is a property of the material type and the light, just like the ambient light. But this is now a function of the dot product between the normal, which basically tells you the direction of that surface, 
and where that light source is, right? But once the intensity of that dot has been uh, described, that light scatters in all directions and it doesn't matter where the eye is. To then figure out the reflected light of a specular, what you do is you figure out where that light reflects to, and if the light reflects right into your eye, that'll be the brightest, but if your eye is in a different position, then it's not as bright or you may even not have any specular light at all. The way that OpenGL does this in the fixed pipeline is to use a Blinfong shading. So what Blinfong actually does is it calculates the half vector um, and then dots that with the normal vector, take it to the power of S, which is the shininess, and then multiply the material color and the light color together, and then you add all of that up to uh, give you the final result of, of the lighting. Um, this, of course, happens for all of the components, um, but it also happens for all of the light. So if you have more than one light, then basically the emission color gets calculated only once, the global ambient and the material calculates only once, but then the material uh, type and the light components for ambient, diffuse, and specular happens once for every light. So obviously, if you have eight lights, uh, this equation gets a whole lot longer. Um, of course, um, in, in order to make this work, both the light, uh, the material type, and all of these vectors have to be unitized. So you basically go between zero and one, so you can just multiply all those components uh, together. Um, the reason diffuse lighting works the way it does is we're basically looking at the intensity of this particular dot. So if you think about it as a bundle of rays coming in, we're basically looking at the area of that bundle of light and then the area on the surface that it will illuminate. If it is completely uh, uh, parallel or, or uh, perpendicular to that surface, the uh, area of the bundle of light is the same as the area that it illuminates. As you go to a lower and lower angle, that's spread out over a larger area and it becomes more, uh, less bright um, due to the to the lower angle. I mean, it's just like the sun being, when it's directly overhead, it's the brightest, and as you get lower and lower on the horizon, it gets dimmer and dimmer. That's exactly what this does. Uh, it's also referred to as Lambertian reflection. In terms of the specular reflection, the two options that you have is, or the two options that I've discussed, is Fong lighting and Blin Fong lighting. Blin Fong lighting um, uses the half vector calculation Fong lighting um, uh, uses, uh, it, which is not supported by the default OpenGL, actually calculates the reflected distance or vector, and then it takes the I vector, and if those two are exactly coincident, that's the brightest. As you go further and further away, it becomes dimmer and dimmer. So basically what you do is you calculate that reflected angle R, as L dot N, which is just a scalar, times two, which is also still a scalar, multiplied by N, which is a vector, and subtract L. So this vector direction R here is this reflected vector. Then, of course, V is the position of the eye. Of course, the eye is always at zero, uh, zero, zero, zero. So if you're at the point P, then the vector from um, that point P to the eye is simply minus P, right, because you have zero minus P, which is just minus P. Um, the shininess, the material type, and the color, of course, is set for each of those vectors, uh, and you can access this in the um, um, uh, shader by just asking OpenGL what the, the, all of those uh, properties are. Of course, this is what OpenGL does by default. Um, the reason why OpenGL implements this is that as long as the eye is assumed to be straight down the z-axis um, and you basically don't do local lighting, so instead of calculating the vector from P to the origin, you simply take the vector from P straight down the z-axis, so the, the, the I vector is always 0, 0, 1. The equations actually simplifies uh, and you, you can basically just do a scalar calculation for the most part. Um, of course, what pervertex lighting then does is it does the calculation for every vertex, interpolates across the polygon. Uh, in common um, graphics discussions, people often refer to that as garage shading, 
but that's actually not what true garage shading is. True garage shading um, was invented to deal with a case where you've got a surface described in terms of a bunch of discrete values and you don't know what the normals are that actually approximate or, or is uh, perpendicular to the true surface that underlies that description. So what Garage suggested you do is you actually calculate the vector of all of the flat surfaces that surround that point, average them, and then use that as the normal. That's what true Garage shading is, is to then once you've done that averaging, then do the interpolation. Uh, but we've just often uh, used that to, in more general, describe the situation where you're interpolating from the vertices uh, to individual uh, 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 pixels. Of course, by doing it per vertex, the advantage is from perf a performance point of view that if there are very much fewer vertices than there are pixels, then the level of effort required to do these lighting calculations are much uh, less. Uh, but if you have very large polygons, then of course you will lose uh, some of those effects. The nice thing about OpenGL is that you can switch between per vertex lighting and per pixel lighting on a polygon by polygon basis by just switching shaders as often as you have to, right? So you can draw one object with just per vertex lighting and then switch the shader and then draw the, the you know, the floor, for example, with a different shader and, and, and apply that in, in that way. Uh, per pixel lighting works exactly the same way, except what you need to do is you need to set up the appropriate vectors in your vertex shader that you then pass down to your fragment shader and then the calculation actually happens in the fragment shader um, for, uh, to, to do the actual lighting calculations. You just um, have to store the appropriate vectors in your vector shader so that things like the normals uh, and so forth are available in your fragment shader because normally that isn't available in the fragment shader. Yes? Okay. What's the cost of switching shaders? Is that computational? And the skill. What about running two of them simultaneously at C? Do you lose that many optimizations? Uh, it will actually happen under the hood. You don't really have a lot of control over it. Uh, what OpenGL or, or basically the, the graphics driver really provides is a scheduler. And um, as part of the OpenGL pipeline, it sort of figures out, I've got these vertices or, or these shaders to run on these vertices, those fragment shaders, and it knows the dependence between those but there's actually a scheduler under the hood that deals with all of that stuff, and you don't really have a lot of control over that. In fact, you have no control over it. So, so, so consequently, then, would there be a performance overhead for using a bunch of different types of shaders or things that are drastically different? Not really. I mean, the shaders are such small little programs, they really don't take a whole lot of time to swap in and out of the, the CPUs on the GPU. Uh, they're called SMs. So it, it's pretty good at doing that. I, I'm sure there's a little bit of a performance penalty, but we don't really have a lot of control over it. Um, of course, when you do the per pixel lighting calculations, you're moving a lot of those calculations to the actual fragment shader. And so since you have typically much many more fragments, um, you, you actually increase the load. But you know if you have moderately decent hardware, um, you'll actually still get a, a very impressive frame rate. Um, of course, that's lighting. What we typically have to do in order to add realism to our objects is to use textures to make them more interesting. So typically what we do is in our fragment shader, uh, we um, have a pointer to a particular texture that's called a sampler. So basically, in your um, uh, fragment shader, you'll have something that says sampler 2D and then you give it a name. So that's the pointer to the particular texture that you've set up. Um, and then, of course, you have to, in your main program, actually tell um, OpenGL what shader you want uh, to point to. So you bind that shader up in your main program and then inside your uh, fragment shader, you, you give that another name that you can use as a variable to point to. Um, so what I've sort of skipped over is that 
how do you actually associate that particular texture to each of those pointers? Well, what actually we're relying on here is the f a feature in OpenGL that if you don't define a variable name uh, or, or, or set a value for a variable that you define in your, your shader, it gets initialized to zero. So if you only have one shader or one texture in your program by setting, for example, sampler 2D foo, then foo gets initialized to zero. Why that is convenient for us is that if you don't do anything funny, you get texture unit zero. And when you bind a texture to that texture unit, you will point to that uh, zeroth texture unit or your base texture unit. What we'll cover here in about uh, a month is what if in your, uh, your shader you actually want to simultaneously access five different textures, right? So you would have various samplers here, sampler one, sampler two, sampler three, sampler four, but how do you actually know which one maps to which texture? Well, what you do is you bind them to a texture unit and then you have to, in your main program, make sure that this name points to the appropriate texture unit 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, and so forth. So we'll, we'll cover that later, but for now, um, knowing that you, that sampler 2D points to the texture of interest uh, should be enough. And then in the, the particular texture you load up uh, in your main program, either um, using the QPix map or something like that, or the GLBind texture, uh, in OpenGL, uh, you, you associate that with it. To then actually find the particular pixel in that texture that you want to address, what you do is you call texture 2D. And in the texture 2D, you tell it which texture you want to point to. So it's whatever name you use for that texture unit. And then you tell it the coordinates. So because this is a 2D texture, you need to have a VEC2 that then points to where in that texture you want to look up. So textures go from zero to one. So if you pass it 3.5, what happens? Interpolates? Well, it kind of depends what you tell OpenGL you want to do, right? Remember in OpenGL there are those things <coughs> Uh, like uh, texture wrapping, right, where you can have it wrap between 0 and 1, 2 to 3, or you can ask it to mirror so that it goes 0 to 1, 1 to 0, 0 to 1, 1 to 0, as you want, go from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3. Um, you know, there's all kinds of controls that you have on how it translates texture coordinates to the particular pixel. So those settings that you apply in your main program still applies. Um, but instead of the fixed pipeline just reproducing those values for you, you now have to explicitly look those up and what it returns is a VEC4, right? So that VEC4 it returns contains R, G, B, and A, right? The alpha channel is also in there. Even if you store just that texture coordinate, uh, those textures as a three component texture, that alpha value always gets filled in. Um, and you, of course, you're free to ignore it if you, if you want to. Um, there are other functions or other samplers, uh, lookup functions here, depending on what kind of textures you, you're looking up, whether it's 1D or 3D or LOD or whatever you want to deal with. Um, but the main thing is that you always get those four components back. So um, that's basically, you know, what lighting and textures are. Right? They're pretty straightforward, and I'll show you an example here that uh, shows you how I've used it. But what I want you to do for the assignment for next week is to now write a program that does the lighting calculations, and you can, of course, steal all of my code to, to do that, but then change how you do the lighting calculations. Um, or change how you do your calculations in your fragment shader. And of course, you can also use your fragment shader from this week um, to do you know, interesting computations. Um, so things that you may want to look at is, um, is it faster to use integer operations as opposed to floating point operations? Are integer op calculations faster than floating point? Doesn't it depend on the GPU? 
I mean, generally it's floating point double precision, but... Well, but integers is always faster than floats, isn't it? It doesn't depend on the architecture, though, and how they've organized them. What do you mean? Like, if you've got a bunch of processors that are specifically oriented around, oriented around unpacking floats, aren't they necessarily faster? Are there more like, with a specific, like a specific ASIC? Like, granted, it's more complicated to actually pack and unpack them, but if you have a bunch of silicon dedicated to that... Well, so I, my, my computer has an i7 chip in it, right? right? So how, how, what does that processor actually consist of? Well, well, the CPU is one thing, but the GPU is a different one. Well, I, I, I agree, but let, let's talk about the CPU first, right? Well, there, there's stuff to do with memory, there's stuff to do with control flow, but there's actually an integer logic unit that is dedicated to doing integer calculations. There's a floating unit that's dedicated to do floating calculations. To actually switch from ints to floats is actually pretty expensive for multiple reasons. One is you're changing the format, but second, you know, you're sort of, there's a pipeline here and ah, crumbs. Now we have to get over here back to this unit and then get over to that other unit. There's a lot of stuff involved with it. The GPU does things quite differently, right? The GPU is geared towards doing what? It's graphics, right? When do you use integers in graphics? All the time. All the time. No. I'd say more rarely. Never. Well, where, where do you use it? You use it in loop counters? Where else? And technically, you can use it just about anywhere, but the compiler gets mad at you. <laughs> but I mean, why would you use an integer, right? Well, a loop counter has to be an integer, correct? Okay. Because if, if it's like 0.999 and you compare it to 1, then it just doesn't work, right? Or does it? <laughs> right, so depending on what exact hardware you have in your machine, that GPU may or may not have an integer unit. So that's one of the things you can do is make your loops, instead of being integer loops, make them float loops. Just make sure that your test at the end is something that doesn't make the loop infinitely long, right? Because then bad things will happen. Uh, another thing to consider is, uh, for example, one of the, if you do phone lighting, right, one of the things you can do is you can explicitly calculate two times L dot N times N minus L. You can calculate that ex thing explicitly, or you can use the reflect function, right? Or you can use the length function to calculate the length, or you can do explicitly square root of X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared, all of those kinds of things, right? So what's faster, the built-in function or expanding some of those things explicitly? Did you have a question? Yeah, I had a question specifically about using floating point indices and loops. So assuming you use floating point indices and loops, is the compiler still able to inline or unroll or inline those functions? I don't know. You may and, want to investigate. And that. if so, does it differ based on whether you're incrementing by an integer or you're incrementing by a floating point number? Um, you know, do you think there'd be a difference there? Again, this may be something that you may want to investigate. And when you say uh, the compiler, Jealous. Where does the compiler actually live? Well, it's, it's, it depends. It's multiple stages. You have GLSL that then converts it to something that runs in the driver, right? Correct. So not only is it a function of whose OpenGL implementation you talk about, right? If you can look at NVIDIA versus AMD, those are totally, totally different compilers, right? GLSL is a specification. It's not an implementation. So different vendors' implementations will be different. And depending on what specific hardware you have, the specific driver would actually be different as well, right? So how the different compilers do different things from the different vendors and within different uh, hardware cards w w within a certain different same vendor, you may actually get different results. So try it and see what happens. Um, the other thing here is, um, for example, in my um, uh, 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 lighting uh, functions, I actually use a function uh, 
for the lighting calculations and so forth. Would it be faster if instead of using a function, you just actually expanded all of those instructions uh, in, in line in, in the code? How big a difference does it, does it make? Uh, another approach that you could take is you could actually take the exact same piece of code and then go and try it on an NVIDIA machine, you try it on an AMD machine and do a comparison that way. Or, you know, different operating systems, all kinds of different things that you can do. So the assignment for next week is basically try to take the code that I gave you, for example, which, you know, of course I wrote it, so it's very good code. Um, <laughs> but, you know, try to make it better or worse and try different things. Couple of things to bear in mind. Number one is a lot of these examples are pretty Mickey Mouse, right? There's, you know, 24 vertices. So if you look at the performance difference to the vertex shader, you're probably not gonna see a whole lot. So number one, you have to load it up. Uh, how you can do that is, for example, using the Tyrannosaurus object, right? It has a quarter million vertices. So that, that makes a big difference. Uh, the other thing is in your fragment shader, you know, make it full screen, right? Let, let it actually generate a large number of pixels so that you actually really stress out the system before you try to make those uh, measurements. Um, the second thing, of course, is you have to disable vSync, right? Because if you have vSync on, you're going to pretty much get 60 frames per second no matter what. So that was one of the things... Uh, that we did right at the beginning of last semester. So um, go remember how, how you actually disable vSync on your particular hardware um, to make it run fast. So I have a question about vSync specifically. So obviously vSync can be disabled on a normal client, C++ or Qt, whatever application. But when you're doing stuff in the browser, is there automatic vSync implementation? Or is that something you can actually modify in WebGL? You know, I've never looked at that. Um, I I I don't know if you can do that in WebGL or not. It's it's the, there isn't something in the GL expl, um, specification that specifically deals with that. That's that's sort of a driver issue. I don't know if they added that to WebGL or not. I've I've never tried to. But it's a it's a good question. I I don't know the answer to. Um, the last comment that I make will make is prepare to be disappointed because these compilers knows that these. Um, programs are really, really, really going to tax the system because it's going to run lots of times. The vendors have spent an awful lot of time optimizing those compilers. So those compilers generate very, very good code. But on the other hand, you know, look at how long our programs are, right? They're tens of lines, maybe hundreds of lines. It's not that hard to truly optimize a program of that size really well. So another thing that you may want to look at is how can you stick an obstacle in front of the compiler? So one thing to bear in mind, for example, is that um, one of the ways that we often say is how you can speed up a program is by unloading, unrolling a loop. So if you're going to go through that loop 10 times, you just have the code in there 10 times and it'll do it. Well, one of the tricks that the graphics compilers do is they do loop, lots and lots of loop unrolling. Even when you think it would be absolutely crazy to do it, the compiler is still gonna try. So how can you prevent the compiler from unloading a loop, unrolling a loop? It's surprisingly hard, but there is a trick. Yes. Buffer bound. Say again? Variable upper bound. But how do you have to do that variable upper bound? You have to pass it into the shader externally. You have to pass into the shader as a uniform so that the compiler has no way of predicting what that value is. If you set it as a constant or anything like that, 
the compiler can predict exactly how many times, the maximum number of times it will actually go through there. What about a variant? Yes, you can use a varying too, but that will only work in the fragment shader. Yes. Okay, so um, that's basically the idea is sort of go and look at various things to do per with performance. And in order to understand your results, uh, what you will probably have to do is, you know, do a little bit of Googling about what exactly the architectures look like and what the partners look like and so forth. What I'm expecting in terms of the, to, what to turn in is, um, you know, obviously the program that you use, but I'm looking for a discussion that says, I tried this, it didn't make a difference, and here's why. Or I did this and it made a huge difference, and here's why, okay? So what I'm looking for is the explanation rather than, you know, just, well, I tried it and it didn't work. So the load has to come from the shader, not from you're doing something really complicated with calculating vertex. Well, so the question would be, you know, yeah, you do a complicated calculation, but how, what, did you do it in the most optimal way or is there a better way to do it? Or, you know, what, what are the different things that you did and didn't do? that actually did it. I mean, what I'm looking for you to learn about this is what kind of things are bad to do in the shader and what things are not. Okay, so the last thing that I'll, and I'll, I've got example four here. Actually, let me just show you example four here before I talk about um, shadows. So example four is pretty much the same old boring box that you've seen lots and lots of times. Um, so, you know, one thing that you may want to look at is um, the frame rate. So the frame rate is over here. So if I have the box really small, that's the frame rate. If I make the box really big, Down well, it didn't really change. Why not? Well, because I'm using the fixed pipeline, right? So in the fixed pipeline, the lighting happens on a per-vertex basis. So that's pretty fast. All it really has to do is the interpolation. Well, this is a really Mickey Mouse example here. You know, I'm really not stressing the system. Um, maybe, you know, try something more complex. So. I, uh, this is the most complex object that I've done here. Well, you know, it still doesn't look like the vertex shader is really being stressed um, in, in that case. So I've got my own implementations. Uh, the, the first stored implementation basically just repeats what the, the vertex shader does or the fixed pipeline does. So it, it doesn't really do anything. Then I've got my own, whoops, sorry, wrong button my own vertex blend and vertex form calculation, but I'll just skip right to the pixel form calculation. Well, it really doesn't make that much of a difference in terms of um, the, the frame rate for the um, uh, cruiser because the cruiser had a large number of vertices to, to begin with, right? So um, the, it was working fairly hard. Um, but then uh, if I... Uh, switch it to the cube, well, the frame rate really doesn't change, but the result changes dramatically, right? Because now I actually have um, per pixel lighting happening here, and we've got the appropriate reflection happening from the specular. Actually, I don't have it quite right yet. Here, where's the bright? Oh, come on, set it. Does that not, what did I do here? It's per pixel phone lighting. Here, stop the light. Did I break something? Perhaps <coughs> I have broken this here. I'll have to go look. Um, I should have had a bright spot right there. 
on the object as a result of that um, pixel phone. I'll have to go look at the code to see what I did wrong. Uh, but basically, the idea is that by switching through this, I can have all of the different lighting types. And there are actually other lighting types. Uh, the best way to look at it is go into Blender. And under the lighting settings, look at all of the different lighting types that you have. Uh, go and Google all of those lighting kinds and, and, and see how, how they all work. Um, the main thing as far as this particular example is concerned that I need to point out is that um, in the CUGL version that I've, I gave you with this particular uh, program, um, there's a, oops, sorry, no, I didn't put it there, I put it here. In the OpenGL um, function, I put uh, a signal called frames per second. Uh, basically, what that um, does is in my uh, draw function, all I do is to uh, keep track of the elapsed time. And when I, the seconds roll over, uh, then I, I basically see how many frames I've run in the last second. And that's simply done here by incrementing the number of frames. And so if that's a large number, obviously, you know, the, the precision is about as good as the, the actual timer that I have here. And then I just emit uh, that um, frame rate here that I then can connect to my um, uh, screen there to see what the frame rate is. As you see, my frame rate is up there in the thousands. So you can actually experiment a little bit with um, the um, the precision of this, maybe you can increase it to a larger number of seconds if you're trying to make a more precise measurement of the number of frames and so forth. Uh, so that, that functionality is there. Um, otherwise, basically, the only things of interest is, oh, come on, are the actual shaders. So uh, I should just... Uh, Take a look at this one because I think I must have broken it. So this is, uh, oh no, this is blend foam. Uh, I think I, I mislabeled them, that's, that's the problem. Oh, come on. It's really hard to type if you can't feel your fingers. Um, so this is the per pixel fong um, Hang on one second here. Let me make sure I don't lie to you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's that's what the first one is the, the basic one. That's why, so it's E, not D. There you go, per pixel phone lighting. Um, so in the vertex shader, what I have to do is to make the calculations of the various quantities that I need to pass down to the fragment shader, right? So the quantities I need to know in order to do um, uh, phone lighting is I need to know the vertex or the vector to the light. I need to know the normal vector. I need to know the reflected vector. And I need to know the light vector, right? Or the, the eye vector. So how am I gonna uh, pass those variables down? Well, the first thing I need to do is to figure out the vertex location in model view coordinates. So this calculation I need to do up in the vertex shader because it's the only place that I have access to that GL vertex coordinate. So that gives me the point P. Then to calculate the light direction, I take the light source position minus P. So that gives me the, ve the vertex, uh, the vector from the vertex to the light. 
The normal vector is basically just applying GL normal to that. Again, I have to do that here because it's the only place that those variables are available. Uh, the uh, view direction is basically minus P, so I always do local lighting, right? I don't do any uh, global uh, lighting calculations. Um, and then these vectors are the ones that I need to pass down, light, normal, in view. So light, normal, in view is what's going to be then um, worked on down in my uh, <coughs> fragment shader. Um, notice that I don't normalize them here, right? So my, I don't make them unit length. The reason is that when I am in my fragment shader, what I'm going to have to do is take that interpolated vector value, right? So let's say I had a normal vector that pointed this way, a normal vector that pointed that way. Both of these were unit length. When I now interpolate that to some point here, will that interpolated value still be unit length? No, right? Because the simplest case is, well, you know, this one points 45 degrees that way, that one points 45 degrees that way. The x components cancel out, but the y components are the same, so it's just half of that, right? So uh, it will be, you know, square root of 2 um, in, in length. Uh, sorry, 1 over square root of 2 in length. Um, so that's why I don't try to normalize them here. Um, why do I do this calculation here? So for the ambient color, um, I calculate GL front material dot emission, GL front line product dot ambient, and which of course is the global ambient, and light model ambient times front material ambient. Why would I calculate this calculation up here in my vertex shader? Is it because ambient is the same for all? It, that quantity is the same for every pixel in this polygon, right? Uh, or if it, uh, that value I can figure out at the vertex level and there's no difference whether I do this calculating at the vertex level or the fragment level, right? So by doing that here, I am moving as much of the functionality out of the fragment shader as I can, right, as, as, a, as a performance issue. Uh, of course, I pass down the texture coordinates and the position I need to set this way. So that's, that's pretty straightforward, mm -hmm. right? I now go to my fragment shader, and I basically then do the calculations here. So I take that normal vector and I normalize it. I take the light vector and I normalize it. And then um, I initialize the color to that ambient color that I just calculated up at the top. Now, this is a little bit different than the per pixel lighting that I've shown you before, right? What I actually do is I calculate the diffuse intensity, and then only if it's positive do I do all of these calculations here. Why would I do that? Well, theoretically, if... I don't have to do any of this, and I can decide not to do any of this. That will be a huge performance boost, will it not? Or maybe not. Why would it be that if, you, if this decides that you don't have to do any lighting calculations that it can just skip down to there. That, that surface is pointing away from the eye duct? Well, that's the physical reason, but why wouldn't it be a performance boost to just jump over all of that code? Is this calculation only done on visible vectors based on like your depth buffer? Yes, it is, but that's not the reason, sorry. So, like, it wouldn't even be performed on pixels that weren't, weren't seen? <coughs> well, because here... Because the if statement makes the program branch, then it kind of has to evaluate both branches at the same time? That's very close. 
The GPU uses a single instruction multiple data architecture, right? What does that do? Well, you've got a bunch of instructions that you want to execute, right? And think of it as every pixel is one of the data streams. The way that architecture is set up is only one instruction gets executed by all 2,000 units at the same time. If you have 2,000 pixels and you, one of the pixels need to execute this, but the other 1,999 don't, the other 1,999 has to wait for that one. Right, because everybody has to do the same thing. And how the, the architecture is set up is, if you don't do this branch, you still idle through all of those instructions. You just don't actually perform that calculation, but you have to wait for that last guy to go and do that, right? That's why if statements are so anathema to shaders, right? Because if you have this huge branch of ifs that almost everybody does, but one doesn't, and then one does this bunch of stuff down here, but everybody else doesn't, all the processors still have to step through all of those, right? So really this, even though this makes the logic easier to understand, may still have to be run through all of those other processors to, excuse me, to actually deal with the one guy that, that is you know, going to have to follow that path. So um, the, the if statement here, of course, says that you don't have to do any lighting calculations if that's not true. But assuming that it's true, we're going to increment color by that amount. Then we're going to calculate the reflected distance. Then we're going to figure out the view vector. Then we'll figure out the specular intensity. And only if that specular intensity is positive, then you will actually do this, right? So the structure is a little bit different than what I've shown you before, um, primarily for readability. But in, in effect, the bunch of calculations that are going to be done is going to be very similar. However, if you think of this from an architectural point of view as to how all of those sh different shaders need to run through the exact same program, and some of them just have no ops for all of these, whereas the other ones do it, um, then you know that has important implications for performance, which is something I want you to think about for next week. Do you have any control as to how, do those, how those SIMD instructions get scheduled? Can you intercept, say, earlier on in the pipeline and make sure that certain fragments are running certain things? Pretty much all of that magic is beyond your control. Even with a custom pipeline? Um, you know, you have to know the right people to let you in there. <laughs> GLSL is written at a higher level. It, it doesn't give you access to that kind of stuff. So in CG, you have a little bit more control, but not in GLSL. And of course, if you get into the Vulcan engine, then you can do all kinds of magic. Okay, so, um, and then w down here at the bottom, you return the color, right? So the, the program here basically takes the lighting calculation. Now, one of the things that you can look at is, I wrote this as a function, right? The, is it faster to just take all of these instructions and just inline them here as opposed to calling a function? No. Well, one of the side effects of having a single instruction multiple data system is how do you implement a stack? Yeah. You don't. There is no stack. So how does a function call work in GLSL? Does it do what? Does it do the optimization you were suggesting? Do, do an inline? Does it literally copy Effectively, the yeah. function yeah. into the main? It, it has to. It has no choice, right? So, using functions is just a way of cleaning up your code. 
the compiler basically treats functions as macros and basically has to expand them all just because the architecture doesn't support a traditional function call. In many cases, isn't that effectively what optimizations in GCC do anyway? Well, yes, often. Um, but, you know, here's the entire stinking program, right? If an optimizer can deal with that, it's a really poor optimizer, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, the, the inlining that happens in, you know, large C or C++ programs is just a much harder problem. So, but it, yes, that, that's what many optimizers do. And in fact, in C++, you can actually say inline this and it will actually, you know, you can help, you can help tell the compiler what you want to do as well. Okay, um, so that's basically about lighting. Let me just uh, go back and talk a little bit about um, shadows, right? So we talked about shadows at the end of last semester. Um, you may have zoned out a little bit at that time, so I'll go over this sort of at a high level. Uh, but shadows are really important to realism, right? Um, the, the key thing is that many times when you do raster uh, lighting, there's actually an object between that particular object and the light, so it actually shouldn't be lit up, right? Um, it's important to make the scene look right. However, the problem is that OpenGL doesn't have a GL enable GL shadows function, right? So you actually have to manually implement shadows. Depending on how you, what method you use, you actually ha end up having to render the scene multiple times in order to get the shadows drawn correctly. So the methods that I talked about last semester was examples 34, 35, and 36. 34 was just a planar shadow, right? So you actually just take the object, you map it to the surface, and then you just do a, want some sort of a blending to change the color of that surface that you're mapping it on. Very easy to do, but you know, very difficult to do on if you don't have just shadows on like something like the floor. Example 35 went through the shadow volume algorithm. Uh, the shadow volume algorithm has the advantage of that the only hardware support you need is a stencil buffer, which is pretty much in everything. Uh, and it's implemented in some of the very old versions of OpenGL, so it's guaranteed to work. The downside is it's an utter pain in the patoot for you to do it because you have to totally refactor your entire program to use the shadow volume algorithms. You can't just call GL polygon, for example. You have to pack up everything into these arrays of polygons or points and normals and textures and then pass that on and have a special function that deals with that. The best method is what's called the shadow map algorithm, uh, which is example 36. Basically what it does is it creates a second Z buffer. So what you do is you say, here's my light. I'm going to calculate the distance to all of the objects from that light, and then I'm going to store that in a texture. I'm then going to use that texture as a Z buffer to measure the distance between the pixel I'm drawing and the light, and then see if that is the frontmost object in that particular um, direction. And if it's not the frontmost direction uh, or, or pixel in that direction, then I know that there is a object in between the light and the thing that I'm drawing, and therefore it should be shadowed. Otherwise, if it's the, the frontmost thing, then it is lit, and I can, I can just do that directly. So I'll go back to example 36 and show you, but here's just sort of a, a, a high-level overview of how it works. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to set up another uh, texture that is the projection from the point of view of the light to that object. You're going to store those values. Uh, you're basically going to use the Z buffer to fill in those values, take that Z buffer, put it in a texture, and then when you then draw it from the point of view of the user, you're going to use that texture to look up the distances to determine where it what the frontmost thing is. And this technique is the easiest one to implement, and it was drawn, you know, used in a number of uh, things like Toy Story and whatnot uh, to, to calculate st um, uh, shadows. So the algorithm for applying this is basically a two-part. The first is to generate the shadow map, 
So the, the way that I did it was I bound a frame buffer to a depth texture. Then I drew the scene to basically populate that Z buffer, which is now bound to a texture. Um, then if the relative position between the light and all of the objects in the scene doesn't change, that um, shadow map can be used many, many times. But if either the light moves or any of the objects move, then you have to regenerate that. Um, well, you then draw the scene, and then you basically look up um, the, the de distance by using an automatic texture generation algorithm in OpenGL that's called I-coordinates. But you set up the I-coordinates so that it's not the, the eye that, that views the scene, but rather the light that views the scene. Um, and of course, if it's the depth, the frontmost thing in the, the buffer, then it is lit, otherwise it's not. So um, that is shown in example 36 from last semester, but the key thing in that, of course, is the shader. So the shader for for those are here is the vertex shader for that shadow map algorithm. Basically what it does is it does per pixel lighting, right? What we intend to do is to make the decision whether that pixel is lit or not on a pixel basis. Why is that important? Well, you have to have more detail, right? Because the shadow is not going to line up with the vertices, right? So you don't want the edge of the shadow mapped to the nearest vertex. You need to do it to the nearest pixel, right? So what I'm going to do is to do the same things here, calculate P, light, normal, view, and the M in color, just as I do for regular per pixel lighting, and I pass that down. Um, but then here I need to do something odd. So what I need to do here is set up the eye projection. And the concept of the eye projection is this. I am up here at the light. I want to look down on the scene. And I need to figure out what pixel in that depth texture I need to look up. So in order to do that, we set up these eye plane vectors that basically points perpendicular. Oh, come on. This is hard to do with just a hand and a half. So this is the S and T directions. This is the R direction. And then the Q direction is just to make this homogeneous, right? So basically, this is the projection that we're going to set up. And what the I coordinates then uh, tells you is if you have a pixel anywhere in this projection, how you go from that particular pixel back to the original texture coordinates, right? So these vectors that we set up here, the I plane vectors, um, I'm going to have to set up in my main program when I actually set up that projection. But I now map that to the second texture coordinate, right? Because I'm going to use two simultaneous texture coordinates here. One is the textures that I apply to the scene. The other is the texture coordinates that I'm going to use to look up this depth texture um, in the, 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 the depth texture map. And of course, the position is just whatever it is. So now, looking at the fragment shader, the fragment shader basically takes that regular texture, which is stored in texture unit 0, and I multiply that by the lighting calculation. So that, that part is obvious. But now look at my samplers. I have two samplers. I have a sampler that is the actual texture coordinate that I'm looking up. And then I have another sampler that looks up the depth texture. And it specifically says this is a shadow sampler because it has only one value stored in it. It's a scalar texture, actually. And here's the lighting calculation. So I first set the color of that pixel equal to the ambient color. If I'm shadowed, you're done, right? 
if a pixel is in a shadow, it is as if there is no light, right? So it just gets set to the ambient light. So this if min statement here now says, take texture coordinate one, which is the second texture coordinate, which is going to be the texture coordinate as previewed from the, from the um, light position, and look up that depth or that texture in the depth texture. And I'll just use the alpha value. All four of them are set to the same value. I ask, is that equal to one? If that is equal to one, you are at a pixel that is the closest of all of the pixels to the light vector. If that is true, it is not shadowed, and you have to do the lighting calculations. How do I do the lighting calculations? Well, I do it just the way I did before. I figure out N and L. Notice that I don't do N and L until I've actually decided that this is true. Is that truly an optimization? Not on a SIMD machine it isn't, but it makes me feel better. I do calculate the diffuse intensity. If the diffuse intensity is positive, I do the specular calculation, and I keep on adding that to the ambient, and then I return the color. So in terms of the complexity of the shader, it's a trivial addition, right? All I have to do is to decide if I am the shallowest thing in the depth buffer as b b pointed to from the, the eye position, and if it is, then I do the rest of the lighting calculations, either, then otherwise I don't. So it's a very simple change to the, to the shader itself. However, the results are, you know, that you now have shadows. What's the price you have to pay? Well, first of all, you have to figure out all of those vectors. And second of all, you have to generate that shadow map, right? And that in itself is quite a chore. And if you go back to example 36, you'll see that what we have to do <coughs> is in the init map function, whoops, oh come on. What we do is we figure out, first of all, how big a texture can we have. Um, then we create that new texture by calling GL active texture one, so that activates a new texture unit. Um, we allocate the texture to that particular size. We set its parameters. Um, and then here we bind that texture to a frame buffer. So um, first of all, we call, generate a new frame buffer name, map that frame buffer to it, and then we switch back to the original frame buffer. So. That's the initial setup of the buffer to then do the shadow map. What we do is, first of all, we set everything in so that we remember what those, those values are because we're going to really mess with the transformations. We set up a new projection so that we're basically looking from the light position to the center of the scene. We set up a transformation for the model view matrix. Uh, that's simply the identity matrix. And then we basically switch to the new frame buffer so that instead of writing to the screen, we're now going to write to that off-screen off frame buffer. Um, we draw the scene, and we draw the scene with a value of zero. What does a value of zero do? Well, it basically, when we render that scene, we're only interested in one thing, the answer from the z-buffer, right? So in order to do that, what we want to do is just populate it with the appropriate um, z-values that we can use, and any of the subtleties, such as color variations over the surface or anything like that, we don't care about. So 
We make the shade model flat so that all of that garage shading doesn't happen. Um, we can basically make the rebuffer in the right, uh, the um, uh, texture units um, inoperative. So we just go through that as fast as we can. And then at this point, we basically have the answer that we want. The only other thing that we need to do is to actually set up these um, vectors that are going to be the, the vectors that we're going to, to use to do the automatic texture coordinate generation. So here I'm using the OpenGL functionality to help me figure this out. So I basically take the projection and model view matrices that I generated up here, and I add to that the translation that you used in the NDC to RGB translator, right? Except here, I'm doing it in two dimensions instead of three. So the coordinates go from minus one to plus one in both directions. I needed to go to from zero to one. Why? Because we're talking texture coordinates, right? So texture coordinates in RGB goes from zero to one. It's only the spatial coordinates that goes from minus one to plus one. So by doing translate and scale by a half and a half, we basically uh, effectuate that, right? So I multiply all of those together, and then I just basically pull this out of the resulting matrix, and then this matrix, is it a row major column matrix or a column major matrix? OpenGL stores all of its matrices in column major order. So what I'm pulling out here are rows, not columns. The sem semicolons and sev commas or something? No, look, so for example, the SVAC, the 0, 1, 2, 3 component is actually 0, 4, 8, 12. Uh -oh. So I'm pulling things out of a row. So what's the relationship between the rows and the columns in a, tr a rotation matrix? Remember? So if, if I have a vector that points down the x-axis, and I know where I want to transform that, if I set up a rotation matrix, what do I do with that vector? You cross it with, you take the cross product with, um, no, it's even simpler than that. That vector becomes the first column in the rotation matrix. Transpose it, right? Um, well, yeah, well, so the, the XYZ values get stacked XYZ. It's the first column in the matrix. What do you do with the Y axis? It's the second column, right? And the third column has to be the cross product of the first two. Otherwise, you're going to shear the heck out of that transformation, right? So if I have a vector and I want to make it point in a certain direction, I make the column vectors that particular direction. So if I wanted to invert the process, what are the vectors that I have to pull out of it? Uh, the rows. So the rows, right? So the rows basically becomes then the inversion of that process. So that's basically what we're trying to do here, is we're trying to figure out what those vectors are that we have to dot with the directions that we have to basically invert that matrix for us so we basically we can use that to do the calculations. It takes a while to get your head around it, but it does work. Okay, so the bottom line is that for doing both lighting, and especially if you want to add shadows to that lighting, um, shaders are the only way to go, right? Because in OpenGL, how do you invoke per pixel shading in the fixed pipeline? You don't. 
There is no support for it, at least not in OpenGL so far, right? They may at some point say, GL enable, GL pixel shading, and you know, implement that in the fixed pipeline, but I don't think it's gonna happen, right? Because we can just write our own shaders to do it. Um, to do shadows, we have to write our own shadow, shader to do that. Uh, and there's two reasons why. Number one, there is no support for it in the fixed pipeline. But second, generating that shadow map that you actually need to do that is quite a chore. Um, and, you know, example 36 from last semester uh, shows you how to do that. But um, the bottom line is that it's, it's a pretty straightforward process once that's set up to actually apply that in your shader because all you do is per pixel lighting and if it's shadowed, you just don't do anything other than ambient light. Okay. So that's pretty much it. Um, for next week, I am looking for some volunteers. So if I can find out again where I did that, I may just have to change directories. You know, for some reason, I have a mental block against that this is the spring of 2017. Um, my wonderful MD Next program says if nobody volunteers, those are our volunteers for next week. But if you are interested in volunteering, um, just um, go to Moodle and just put your name on the scheduler so that uh, we know that you want to do this. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions? Have at it. Well, I just wanted to ask, like, what, what's the reason why, um, for why OpenGL does not include things like shadow mapping in, in the fixed pipeline? Well, it, it, it's obviously very easy to apply a shadow map, but to actually generate that shadow map is a pain in the patoot, right? Because you basically have to render the scene once for the shadow map and another time to actually draw it. There really isn't a very elegant way of saying, here's my scene, now go do it twice, once with the fixed pipeline, I mean for the, for the shadow map, and once for that, right? So because you have to have these two sequential operations, it's just very hard to make that happen in an abstract sense. So if, if you can figure out how to do it, Automatically by just putting GL enable GL shadows, you will be famous. There's like a search protector on your computer or anything like. So, in in other packages like RenderMan, for example, yes, you can you can just it's just a switch that you turn on, but it's because it's a totally different approach, right? Everything is just happens. It's just like a huge file. It basically is a scene description. And so it understands the scene. It's not like a library that you just call parts out. Anything else? See so you next week. For, sorry, sorry, uh, one more question. Uh, so for the next assignment, what we will submit is a report, right? Well, I, I want the program, but the README it needs to, is basically what it's all about. The, in the README, I want you to sort of discuss all of the things that you're not looking for like graph statistical analysis of frame rates well you if you're up to it by all means but um, no I'm, I'm other things I love this class yeah. <laughs> yeah you have to have a life too yes I understand so yeah, the short answer is yes it's sort of like a report but it's just in the readme it doesn't have to be and I can use the example four code. Example four, you know, sort of gives you the infrastructure to actually, you know, do the experiments and you can just play with the shaders. Uh, the one thing that you may want to do is swap out the cruiser object for the Tyrannosaurus just to have more vertices. The one problem that you may run into is on some Windows machines, it, that thing will compile, but it will take for freaking ever and it won't run. Um, it's on the persistent lake. There's, there's a bunch of objects, so you can pull the terrain source down from there. Um, but the problem basically is, 
When you build all of those things into the executable, the executable becomes very large because the Tyrannosaurus file becomes very large. So either you have to not make it a resource so it doesn't get compiled into the executable, uh, but then you have to deal with making sure that it's in the right subdirectory and pulling it in. So it's a bit of a chore. But if, if it'll compile a file with that, then on my machine it'll compile. It just takes a few minutes to actually just build the executable because of that very large resource that you're compiling into. That's why I don't put it in the, the example because then people say, well, your example's broken because it won't compile. And, uh, so, and how do you disable the... Uh, v-sync? Yeah. So on my...